Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to worship with Spearfish United Methodist Church. Spearfish is located in far western South Dakota, almost Wyoming, and uh, Spearfish is located then on the northern side of the Black Hills, and it is just a joy to welcome you into worship today. I'm Pastor Scott McCurdy. Today we're going to be doing this in, in a different way. Just for fun, we're going to toss it up and do this in a very, very intimate way, just you and me. And so today, what I want to invite you to do is get your Bible. Get your Bible. I really, really want to guide you through as, as we continue to walk through Mark, and I want to show you some things between the Old and the New Testaments that you're going to want to see, and you're going to want to have marked in, in your own. But then also, this is the, the first weekend or the first Sunday of the month, and we're going to be celebrating communion in the congregation and live worship. Well, I want to guide you into a love feast. And, and so what I want to invite you to do is to just put it on pause right now. Go get your Bible, but also go get, what, a piece of bread, half a donut, something, something to eat, and something to drink. It can be your favorite cup of coffee. It can be a glass of water. It can be a Gatorade. And, uh, and we're going to walk through that together. All right. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Lord, I want to give you thanks for this day and give you thanks for this time. Ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have in store for us. Lord, may it be that we know and see your will and work in our world and that it is our hands that are helping make it happen. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to simply sing along on the chorus, Trust and Obey. light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love, until all on the altar we lay. The favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy us, but to trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. I want to invite you to pray with me. Lord, you know all the ways that we are familiar with gospel. You know all the ways that we have acted out the gospel and the, and the Bible stories in our lives. 
Lord, you know all the ways that we've tried to live out the stories. So Lord, now we ask that you would help us to bring about the stories, to make the kingdom of God real inside of our lives as we worship today, as we come before you, ask that you would open our hearts, our minds, Lord, open our eyes to the world around us in which we live, that it's not a world that's just passing by, it's a world that we are a part of, simply because you created us as part of it. In Jesus' name, so Lord, now we ask, amen. I'm going to da- jump right into teaching today. And rather than separating out the gospel and uh, uh, making it separate from the rest of, uh, of the sermon and the message, today what I want to do is to, is to weave all of this together. And so it is it's simply looking and asking, now what is it that God has in store for us? Inside of this summer, we have been walking step by step through the gospel according to Mark. Now, you, you, it really helps if you ask some very serious questions inside of this. I mean, things that we just take for granted and, uh, and don't even know about. For instance, how is it that we know the story of Jesus Christ? Well, it comes down really and truly to four documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in those, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all related. They're called the Synoptic Gospels, and the reason for this is that Matthew and Luke copied Mark. Mark was the first gospel. Why? Why was Mark written? I mean, after all, they had gone almost two full generations after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection without having to write anything down. Everything was verbal. Everything was oral. It was, it was passed down story by story from speaker to listener. Something happened. Well, it was in the year 66 that there was a huge uprising inside of Israel. And uh, the the Jewish people tried to break away from the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire would have nothing to do with that. They came in and just crushed, just crushed Jerusalem. The entire, they they estimate that a, a million Jews died inside of that time. Jerusalem was obliterated and uh, pretty much everything that had been traditional Judaism was was wiped off the map. They knew this was coming. The, the, I mean, you, you could just sense the political tension. You could just sense that something wasn't right. You could sense that they really, really needed to, to have. And so, so somehow, in some way, Mark was written down. One of the core verses that comes out of the Jewish tradition was a verse that was spoken every morning, every day, inside of their tradition. And to this day, people just have this memorized. From the book of Deuteronomy, and now from here on out, anytime that I'm talking, and give you this Bible, Bible verse, I'm going to give you just this little window to pause. Go find it in your Bible. And if you're like I am, I love to write in my Bible. So if you need a pen or a pencil, to write down what's happening inside of here. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When we talk about Jesus, we have to absolutely talk about the fact that Jesus was raised Jewish. Jesus was never Christian. He was Jewish. He knew this. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. And this is one of the most important things that he wanted people to know. You have got to listen to God. You have got to hear Israel. Now today, in Mark, we are going to jump into chapter 11, and I want, I want to share with you two stories that are, that are coming out of this. Thus far, 
the first 10 chapters of Mark have been about Jesus' establishment. He was baptized. He was tempted. He, uh, he, he gathered some disciples. They began to go out and preach, teach, and heal to do the work of God, to bring about the kingdom of God. Jesus' concept of the kingdom of God was very, very powerful and very, very real. He did not believe that heaven started after you die. He believed that it started right here, right now. The kingdom of God begins here and now. Then we hear the stories of his preaching and his teaching and his traveling and his, his, his healing and his miracles. But then we get into chapter 11 and the entire tone changes. Everything changes. Jesus has been coming down from Jerusalem and now he enters Jerusalem. I want to show you something about this. Would you turn to Mark chapter 11? We're going to look at the first 11 verses. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you will find a coat, colt tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. Now, parenthetically, what I, what I believe is that that was not some random stranger. There had been prior arrangements made with friends in the Jerusalem area to make this happen. Okay, now let's keep going. Verse 4. They went out and found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a direct quote from Psalm 118. See the tie here. Blessed is the come, is coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We know that story. We've, we've heard that story forever and a day. That's the story of Palm Sunday. But now the question is, where did that story come from? Because that was not random. None of this was random. Did you know that simultaneously on that day, at that time, on the other side of town, at one of the other gates, the Roman army was entering? This was something that the Romans did every year. You see, the Jewish territory was problematic. It was, it was really, really hard to, be a, to govern over these people. And, and what, what Jesus did then was, while the army was coming in in a show of force on one side, Jesus was coming in in a show of humility on the other side. Really? Why would he choose to do that? Here is a prophecy from Zechariah. So I'm going to be reading now in, in the last part of the Old Testament <clears throat> from the book of Zechariah in the ninth chapter. And I am going to be reading... Ah! Oh, got it. Got it in the ninth, in the ninth verse. All right, listen to this. Read along with me. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow, bow will be broken. And God will proclaim peace. The king will proclaim peace to the nations. This king will rule, extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Oh, well, that's interesting. 
Now, here's what I want you to see. At times, some of us have known about this prophecy. I mean, we've heard about it. And, and, and we, then we hear about Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And we say, oh, look at that. What a coincidence. That was spoken in the Old Testament. And now Jesus is doing it in his story. Oh, no, 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 no. This was no coincidence. Jesus knew this story and was acting it out. He was reliving the story. Every part of that was no coincidence. It was very intentional on Jesus' part. A new kind of king entering not in power but in humility into Jerusalem, the heart of Jewish and now Roman power. All right, now, turn back to Mark, to Mark again, into that 11th chapter. This time, I want you to pick up on the very next verse, on Mark 11, verse 12. This is the clearing of the temple. The next day, so now this would have been Monday. As they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit, and when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. There's the quote, a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and the disciples went out of the city. All right. You may think that was random. It is not. Now, I want you to turn back to the Old Testament with me again, this time to the book of Jeremiah. We're going to go to Jeremiah 7, and we're going to begin in verse 9. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we're safe, safe to do all of these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. This was not random. This was another case where Jesus didn't simply happen to go into the temple, flip it upside down, cause the chaos, and then somebody said, Oh, look at that! What a coincidence! It says this in the Old Testament. Oh! No, 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 no. Jesus knew this passage. He chose this passage. He chose this passage so he could act it out, live it out, so that he could bring about the kingdom of God. This is what we're looking at today. This is what I really, really want you to see. In, in everything that we are talking about inside of, of Mark, we're looking now at Jesus with this deep, deep belief in the kingdom of God. He absolutely believed that the kingdom of God was about to happen. When he was telling people to repent, to turn around, to do it now, the reason was very specifically because the kingdom of God was coming right now. You needed to be ready for it. You needed to be prepared. 
What did he mean by the kingdom of God? Well, for him, I think that what that what he was talking about was was the fact that 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 the presence of God permeates this world, permeates this universe. We do not worship a God who is simply up there, out there, far away, watching what goes on down here. We don't worship a God who is the, the great sheriff in the sky, watching us from above, and anytime we do something wrong, zap, we, we get punished. No, the kingdom of God had to do with life and breath. When, when we look at the word for the Holy Spirit in both Greek and, uh, and Hebrew, in Greek it's the word pneuma. In Hebrew it's the word ruach. Both of these words simultaneously mean, yes, Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, but also <sighs> breath. And simultaneously, <sighs> wind. The Spirit of God is within us as close as our own breath, surrounding us as powerfully as the wind. This is what Jesus believed. And inside of that, what was he trying to do? I believe that Jesus was trying to trigger the kingdom of God by choosing these very specific biblical stories, these stories from the prophets that his people knew, believed, and had grown up with. He was acting out those stories so that people could see that they could live out those stories, so that people could see that they could bring about the kingdom of God, that the living presence of God was coming, and that these actions, the courage that it took to come down into Jerusalem when he could have stayed up into the Northland and been perfectly safe, these were triggers. These were invitations to God to say, bring the kingdom now. Let it start now. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one, and you shall worship him with all your heart and mind and strength. Jesus was trying to make this incredibly real. So now, let me ask you this. Do you ever do this? Jesus did it. He chose scripture, he acted it out, he lived it out to bring about the kingdom of God. I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think that we have been doing this for 2,000 years as Christians. I think that we have been doing this all of our lifetimes, but that a lot of times we don't realize that that's what we're doing. All right, let me let me give you this example. There was a day when Jesus was out with a crowd of, of about 5,000 people. And uh, and as, as they were in a lonely spot, Jesus said to the disciples, okay, go ahead and feed them. And the disciples said, are you crazy? We got nothing. And Jesus said, we have more than you think. And they fed the 5,000. Has there ever been a time when you have been invited to help feed someone, whether that was physically, spiritually, emotionally, whatever it may be, in whatever way, have you ever been invited to feed someone using only what you have? Guess what? Anytime you do that, you are acting out that story, living out that teaching, and bringing about the kingdom of God inside your own world. Because the kingdom of God begins now. All right, let me give you another one. The Jewish army came up against an outside force, and they brought one of their huge soldiers out onto the field and said, we challenge you to an individual time of, of, of battle. This is the story of David and Goliath. We all know the story. And all we have to do is to use that metaphor anytime that we say, oh, that's, man, that's David and Goliath. That's a David and Goliath moment. That, that's David going up against Goliath. We know exactly what that means. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever been really behind the eight ball and forced 
to to really be thinking how how do I meet the challenge that is uh, if in front of me when you are David and Goliath is standing right there yeah and what do you do we act out the story because it helps us to understand to live out the story so that we can bring about the glory the glory of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God starts now all right, let me give you another one. Um, oh, 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 oh. Uh, two more for you. Uh, one is the Good Samaritan. And Jesus told the parable. It wasn't a story that really happened. It was simply a story. And there was a guy who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the road he was beat up and left for dead. Two people passed him and left him for dead. And then a third guy came along, a Samaritan the guy that this Jewish man lying on the side of the road would have hated. And instead of going with old prejudices, the Samaritan picked him up, dusted him off, put him on his donkey, and took him to a motel, to an inn, where he was brought back to health. We use this Good Samaritan image all the time. It's deep, deep, deep within us. We know what it means, and we are encouraged. We teach our children all the time. You need to be a Good Samaritan. Have you ever done this? Absolutely you have. And when you have, you were doing the exact same thing that Jesus was doing. He chose a story from scripture to act out so that he could live out and bring about the kingdom of God. Anytime that you have become the Good Samaritan, you are bringing about the kingdom of God because it begins right here, right now. Last one, the nativity. Matthew, Luke, Jesus came into this world as a baby and there were angels and there were stars and there were wise men. How is it that we have nativity? Did, did you know that we attribute our nativity scenes to St. Francis of Assisi? Back in St. Francis's day, very few people knew how to read. And so he, figured out how to act it out. Sometimes it would be live, sometimes it would be in stained glass windows, sometimes it would be in statues, however it was. But we began to understand the coming of Christ into our world as a baby because it was acted out. Oh, why? As St. Francis taught, so that it could be lived out. Why? So that anyone who does this, who acts out and lives out the, the story of the nativity, the coming of Christ into our lives, is now bringing about the kingdom of God. I believe, I believe in the kingdom of God because I see the kingdom of God all the time. You got to be looking for it. But you can see it all the time, any time that you are seeing care, compassion, patience. Let me tell you just a, a weird little way that I saw it. Uh, Colleen and I went on vacation last week and we wound up over in the Twin Cities visiting both of our sisters and, and on one night uh, we decided to go out to a Thai restaurant out across town and as we came to a busy intersection I could not believe what 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 happened. There, as the light turned and our lane was green and good to go, there was a car in front of us, but there was another car coming from the right who wasn't paying attention. They did not see the light. It wasn't that they were trying to run it. They just didn't see it and got into the middle of the intersection and shoulda, coulda, woulda been T-boned by the car in front of us. And instead, the car in front of us stopped with about eight inches to go before smacking these. The people in the car that ran the red light just were, were frozen. They didn't even know what to do. They just sat there. Nobody honked. Couldn't hear any cussing. Eventually, after, after a, a few seconds, the car that wasn't supposed to be there put it into, into gear, backed up, and life went on. Now, you can say, that was just a traffic thing. 
Or you could also say that was the kingdom of God happening right here on earth. That accident didn't happen. There was no explosion of anger. Someone was alert, aware, driving defensively, patient, as patient as you could be in that situation. The kingdom of heaven is all around us if we are only willing to look in times that are chaotic and as we look at at the delta variant out there as we look at people trying to refigure out as we look at the economy trying to, to wake itself up as we look at our own communities and families as we look at so much that's going out i want you to look for the kingdom of god this is intentionally what jesus came for was to bring the kingdom of god intentionally acting it out so that it could be lived out, so that it could bring about the glory of the kingdom of heaven right then and right there. And this is where we are. So my friends, this week, what I'm inviting you to do is to be fully present and to be acting out, living out, and bringing about the kingdom of God inside of your own world, inside of your own life. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to pray, and and this is not just an end of the sermon prayer, but I want us to go deeper inside of this. So now, if you are watching this with others, this is going to be the point where I want you to turn off, just put her on pause, and spend time with your friends there in the room with you, and speak to each other. What do you need to pray about? then I want, you to, I want to invite you to pray with each other, for each other. Now, if you're comfortable, do this out loud. If you're comfortable, let all of you do it. Take turns. If you're not comfortable, then here are two options. One person simply prays for the rest. Or, all of you simply pray in silence. It's powerful, any way you, any way you slice it. All right, all right, all right. Come on. First, begin by putting it on pause and praying, and then come back, and we're going to pray together. Let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, I want to give you thanks for this day, for this moment, for the ways that we have to worship you. Sometimes that worship is in the beauty of high holiness as we see the formality of worship. Sometimes that worship is just loud and raucous and informal. Sometimes it's in a church building. Sometimes it's out. But Lord, then there's the other ways that we worship you. The other ways that we extricate ourselves out of car accidents that don't happen. The ways that we have patience with people who don't deserve our patience. The ways that we love people who don't deserve to be loved. Lord, this is what you taught us. This is what you showed us. So Lord, help us to live out, to act out, to bring about the kingdom of God simply by how we care. Today, Lord, we lift up our nation and pray for all those everywhere who are really struggling right now, for those who are struggling in work and finding work, for those who are struggling to find and keep a place to stay, for those who are struggling with their health, for those who live in food insecurity, for those, Lord, who are living in the the presence of abuse. We pray that you would be there with them But Lord, we pray even more deeply that you would use our hands to help in each of these situations. It's not just about praying, Lord, you help them. It's about praying, Lord, help us to help them. Gracious God, may the kingdom of God God become alive and real inside of our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to invite you into what is called a love feast. Now, uh, my preference is not to do formal communion online. I love to do love feast instead. And there's a difference. The difference is that in communion, we gather and we bless the elements, the very specific elements of bread and cup in that time of worship together. A love feast is far more informal, using any kind, anything that you have to eat, using anything that you have to drink, knowing that all of it can be holy in God's eyes. So, if you haven't already gotten it, put it on pause and go get something to eat and drink. All right, my friends. You know that it was it was in those those last moments of Jesus' life, on that night when Jesus was betrayed, that he actually sat in the upper room with his disciples. It had only been three or four days earlier that he had ridden the donkey into town and everyone was cheering, and now the cheers turned to booze. Now it turned dangerous. And on that night, Jesus knew that they were on the threshold of danger. And so in that meal, they took the bread and Jesus broke this bread. I mean, it was just the common bread that was that, that's at your table and, and blessing it, broke it and passed it among his disciples and said, now take and eat for this is my body, the, the body of, of a new, this is, this is my body broken for you. Later, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, cup of wine, which was again, what was common at the table. And blessing it, pastored it among his disciples and said, Now take and drink, because this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant that is given for the forgiveness of many. Do you think the disciples understood what he was saying? I highly doubt it. But he modeled it, and he did it, and he lived it to show them. And in that moment, even with Judas at the table, they remembered and celebrated Christ's presence. So, I invite you now to simply take, eat, a bite or two or three. I invite you to drink and to remember that you are part of a Christian community. You, you are part of a church or can be, wherever that congregation may be. And you are part of the kingdom of God acting it out so you can live it out so that you can bring it about this is the love feast that we share let's pray so Lord I lift up this food this drink and pray your presence not just now but Lord every day every day that you would guide us we open ourselves in Jesus name Amen. Well, my friends, I am so glad that you joined us today. We're going to close our time together with uh, with the hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Same thing that I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to invite you to simply sing along on the chorus. Pass me not, O Gentle Savior,
Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Receive this blessing. May you go now as a people who have been named by God and claimed by God so that you can live the love of God. Act it out. So that you can live it out. So you can bring about the glory of the kingdom of heaven right now in your life. So go in the name of God, who is our creator, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, our guide. And as you go, may it always be in God's peace. Go.